Germany and he studied art there where he interned with the Italian artist Rinaldo Cassaro and learned to paint movie posters as well as landscapes and figures. Uh, Frank has also lived and painted in the south of France for three years and has painted on location in many countries around the world. In 1994, Frank came to this country and has continued his art career here. He currently resides in California. I met our guest artist recently um, via Zoom practice, and he told me that he did not like to be called a watercolorist. He sees himself as an artist first and foremost, and he is able to paint a scene in oil, wash, or watercolor with equal ease. Frank really didn't take watercolor seriously as a medium until about 15 years ago. Now he is a signature member of the American Watercolor Society, the National Watercolor Society, and the Transparent Watercolor Society of America. He's also an artist member of the California Art Club. Frank hopes to touch the viewers of his paintings on an emotional level. He says, if my art can stop someone and keep them in that present moment, I feel I may have added positively to this person's life experience. Let us welcome tonight, Frank Eber. Frank? Are you ready for us? Yes, yeah, sure. As ready as I can ever be, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. It's kind of nice to see the people there on the other screen. Because uh, these, these Zoom sessions are always very strange, I think, because um, you have no interaction with anybody. But it is what it is. Uh, yeah, the wanna... last artist we had suggested that a few of us leave our mics open so that we could give them, give her some feedback. Maybe you'd like that too. I don't know. Leave what open? Leave a few mics open. Oh, yeah. Well, I can see it from here. So that's pretty neat, actually. Okay. Um, and I people. usually... I usually uh, read what's going on in the chat so that I can pose those questions to you. Uh, as oh, good. Okay. Person. That's how it works. All right. Yeah, we'll do that. So I'll talk about a few things before I start painting. Um, <clears throat> that was a nice introduction. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the thing with uh, medium is, uh, you know, uh, I always talk about this in my workshops too. Um, watercolor is just a medium. It's a nice medium and it can do great things. Um, but it's nothing special, and uh, in my opinion, its greatest downfall is it's uh, it's too techy, and people focus too much on technique. In fact, if you think about it, everything we ever do is all like technique based, and uh, all the questions you get in workshops are all techy questions, um, you know, and it's always this whole. It's almost like its biggest downfall that it's people think it's the hardest medium to paint in, um, which is really not true. It's just different than other mediums. Um, so people focus only on this technique part and never move on from, from it. Um, and then the other big problem I see with in these last 12 years, and I was part of the problem actually, um, is there's a lot of these painters that paint these hour paintings. Um, and it became sort of a, a, it's almost like a performance, just sort of what I'm doing here too. And all these things are basically a problem because, you know, art is, should be about self-expression and you have to say something with art. And if it's just focused on technique, that's not enough. In fact, that's not even a quarter enough. So um, that's that's probably uh, enough for this. But um, yeah, so every medium has its strength and, and uh, weaknesses, of course. 
watercolor, uh, as you all know, you know, the old adage, it paints itself, <clears throat> is a good one because a lot of things do happen by itself, which is, of course, its biggest strength, in my opinion. And that's kind of a very neat feature that is really not possible in other mediums. Um, so, therefore, that's something, you know, in, in the act of expressing what we want to express on a personal level as artists, we need to use that strength of, of the medium as much as we can, because that's where it's good at, that's where it shines. Um, and uh, so, yeah. What else? Yeah, a, a quick word about materials here. You, you all see my palette here. This is a Holbein metal palette. It's, <clears throat> it's a nice little palette. It's just uh, got good big dividers here in the middle between the wells where you mix, which is really cool because you can fill these up quite high with water. And as you all know, the biggest ingredient we use is water, or the one we, we use the most of. So we need to be able to have a palette that actually fills up uh, and doesn't fill up in the paint wells. Because there's nothing, you know, there's some palettes that have these big paint wells. And then after a while, all you have in there is it's like this soup of, uh, mostly water and a little bit of paint. So these are fairly small here, as you can see. So you can fill them up with pigments. And then when you pick up pigment, you actually pick up pigment and not just water. <clears throat> what else? A uh, bit a uh, word about brushes. I like the, the synthetic round brush, like, like this one. And uh, they come in different sizes, but I usually only use one size. And then calligraphy brushes, I use a lot. These are nice Japanese and, and Chinese made. Uh, they're very cheap because they're, um, they're not really high quality bristles. Or someone told me they have, they use horse hair. Um, so nothing like a sable brush. <laughs> and then synthetic round brushes like these here. These are Da Vinci's. This is a Da Vinci also. So they have a nice point. But honestly, I, in every painting, I probably use two or three brushes and that's it. I sometimes, Sometimes when I have this big calligraphy brush, I, I almost paint everything with it. It's, and then in the end, you sometimes you need a, a synthetic round for, for little details and sort of, uh, you know, sometimes you just need that. And then also a, a hockey brush comes in handy for bigger washes. Um, pigments is kind of a wild mix. I do like Daniel Smith, but I also like Holbein. Um, so, and I have some Winston Newton in here. I have all kinds of, uh, so it, you like most artists, you, you find certain colors you really enjoy, and then you end up buying them from, from the same manufacturer. Like for instance, I have this, this is like sort of my go-to color for skies called Horizon Blue. And the only, the only brand that has it is Holbein. So that's where I buy it. Um, so what am I painting? Um, so this is a scene near my house. Uh, it's got sheep in the foreground. You can kind of sort of see it already. My drawings are not very strong, but 
there's some sheep here. There's a shadowy area here. And then we have a building in the background. Some big tree here. And I kind of, I cropped the tree. Uh, that's, a, that's something I often do for compositional reasons. I, you know, you could put that tree right here and go to the edge, but I think it's more powerful if it sort of goes off the page. And you have sort of a path through the picture. That makes sense. So anyway, uh, so this this size is this is a, a arches paper from the blocks. So it's about twelve by sixteen, and then I taped it off, so it's a little less. So arches, I think, cold press, I believe, the green one. I think that uh, is the cold press. Yes. Yeah, I never know which one it, which is which, but they're they're really not that different. Those two, the the rough is almost like the um like the cold press so there's not a, a major difference so you and tend to pay with the blocks huh i tend to put uh, yeah actually uh and then there's this other brand called saunders uh you probably heard of it too saunders yeah. waterford mm -hmm. or something like that um yeah. and they make good paper too i um, I tend to, I almost want to say it's a little easier to paint on those than on the arches. I don't know if you agree or not, but uh, they take these washes a little, a little better than the arches. Arches feels like sometimes you really have to stay wet and really make sure it's running and stuff. Uh, whereas the other, you just apply it and it kind of just runs by itself. So I, I don't know. It's just an impression I have. So I like that paper too. I would say that um, of the artists that we've had demo for us, most of them um, choose Arches or, or, or Waterford Saunders. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of that, that use the Fabriano too, I think. There are some. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't really have any experience with it. Uh, it's supposed to be pretty good paper too, so I don't know. Okay, so a word about the whole process. So this is one of those hour paintings or a little longer, I guess. Um, usually I don't paint like this um, unless I'm outside because you don't have so much time outside. So I so really want to finish a painting, preferably within our hour and a half range, because the light would simply change too much if you're talking about plein air painting, right? Um, but studio time is completely different, of course, and then you do bigger sizes too, and that sort of thing. So um, <clears throat> now I forgot what I was going to say, but. Okay, the process of mixing color right quick. So the way I do my washes, I always mix up primary colors first. So blue, red, yellow. Sheila is asking if you have a source material, like a reference photo for this. I do, it's on my computer, but it's another, it's. It's one of my paintings, basically. Okay, so you've painted it before. Yes. But generally, when you start out painting something new, are you doing it from a reference photo? Oh, yeah. Um, it, obviously, uh, it, it depends. When you paint plein air, then you, you don't. But, but yeah, every, every studio of work, it's basically it's done from photographs. There's, I mean, everybody works from photographs. Uh, I'm no different, but um, oftentimes it's also a fun thing to do when you have a planner sketch, you can bring the sketch home, try to do a bigger version of it since you were on site and you saw the scene and 
he took pictures too, of course, but that's always a tricky thing though, in my opinion, because it happened to me many times that I paint, I painted and repainted in the studio and it just doesn't look the same. It's just, it's just like this whole idea of copying, making it bigger, oftentimes doesn't work mm. unless you just treat it as a new kind of painting. So don't try to replicate the, the plein air piece. Never works. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you know that from experience. <laughs> oh God, I tried that so many times and I'm like, why doesn't this work? And I'm not sure why, but it's just because you you had that moment and then in the studio it's not the same moment so you know you treat it as a treat it as a different challenge and that's that's okay then then that'll be fine can you tell us what colors you're prepping there these are cobalt blue carmine and cad red here and my yellow is a raw sienna light. And do you usually start out with fresh paint squeezed right out of the tube but, uh, each time you paint? No, no, absolutely not. You don't, You the only thing you have to do is spray your paints. Um, <laughs> but otherwise these paints, they, they can sit in here for a few years and then you come back, spray them and they're just like new. So unless the, the well is empty, you don't need to do that. Okay. Great. So these three, when you, you know, they're separated here, but when you mix them together, they make a gray. And you can see, I don't know if you see this, but I'm putting lots of water into these wells. So that's why I'm taking a little time. It's almost like a little ritual, getting this, getting ready to paint. And then while I paint, uh, I'll move this around a little bit. So get ready for that. But I do have an, a bit of an angle here. It's, it's not much, it's pretty flat, but raised a little bit and then when you you know for, for instance I paint the sky <clears throat> paint the sky first then I want this to be smooth I just put it at the at the higher or steeper angle just to let it run and well you see all that so so where it's sitting there, it's maybe just a couple of inches of slant to it at the- Yeah, you can end. see it on the computer, um, uh, on the, you know, the other camera, you can kind of see it here from the side. Ah, okay. You know, you can just, um, like where I'm walking here. Uh huh. So right here, you see the angle. Oh, I see, I see. So I start pretty light up here. And go on the steeper angle actually for now. And pretty much put the red there first. Uh, bring that down a little bit. And then I throw in the other two colors. Put a little blue here. A little yellow.
and then let that all run over, run off. You also go the other direction. And this is all pretty wet right now, so that was the whole in intention to, to start this, uh, make it pretty wet so I can adjust it to finally see the color that I like to see. Yes, it looks very wet. A little darker on top. And you can see these colors, they get muted down when you when you have the three primary colors together, so to speak. They, they basically, um, they gray off basically. Mm -hmm. And I'll bring this all the way to the edge and there is a, a little barn that I will paint around. So to, to the edge where the, where the basically the grass starts later. And you can see I'm already at this stage integrating this little building into this wall. Mm -hmm. Again, still very wet, so I'm going to mix some greens up here. So blue and yellow. And you Red. said your yellow was uh, raw sienna, is that right? Uh, yeah, but this one is, uh, this one is called uh, Hansa yellow. Oh, okay. So sort of a, a brighter yellow, uh, brighter green at this point. If it's not green enough, I can use this turquoise here. and just drop that in. It doesn't matter if it's, um, you know, what, whatever else is there will just be mixing into whatever else is there. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's all, since it's wet, it will have a soft edge. And then if I want this to be cooler, you can see my palette here, I can, I can mix a little bit of a cooler green here. So by putting some turquoise and violet into this, and then it's, it's a little, uh, yeah, temperature is colder, if that makes sense, cooler. And again, I kind of go all over the place with it. And then I can compare these two things while they dry. And then on the right side, I suggest a more distant hill. So mostly blue and violet here. Mm 
can see how it's still very wet, so. And all of a sudden you can see a building here, a tree here. Mm -hmm. And we can still see your bead there of wet paint at the it's bottom of that wash. Totally sitting here, isn't it? Yeah, I keep adjusting this, this green. Now I'm putting more brown into it, like uh, umber. Because I wanted to have different greens here, not just like, you know, the same thing everywhere. Go around this building too. Because when you put this these pigments on, usually what happens is they, they fade about 50% after a minute or so. And that's a that's a thing you have to really uh, be aware of in watercolor because the color is not the color, I always joke. And the value is not the value. So those are the parts that are arguably harder in this medium because if I paint oil and put a color there, it's just going to be that color. There's no change. But here, all of a sudden it gets 50% lighter for no reason. It, wants, it, it does all kinds of funny things with you. Here again, too light, so I gotta be a little stronger with this. So we have this cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. Warm, cool. One of the biggest things you ever learn in painting is not value. Everybody can learn their values. Color temperature is the real challenge. Interesting. Yep, it's the hardest to learn. Most people don't even know, they're not even aware of it. They just put a color. Like, okay, the grass is green. I just put some green there. But as we know, the grass is not green. The grass can be orange. The grass can be anything. It all depends, depends on the ambient light. Anything can have any color. So this is just to the shadow under the roof, because I like to see this go in right now. And I got a little bit of green in here, so I have to kind of spend a little blue after, so to speak. But see, it's, it's dry enough so I can actually judge it now. I think I'm okay. It, well, it's, it will still dry lighter yet. Is that correct? Oh yeah, this is just, I have to redo this in the second go. But the point of, for, for right now, what, I, what I'm trying to do right now is basically put sort of this lighter color and value on here. And then in the second go, I have this softness here, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what will remain. Of course, it will stay soft, even if I, um, in the second time, at second time around, will make some harder edges. You will still see that softness come through, and that's that's sort of the idea here. Oops. Mm -hmm. 
And this now is at a time where you can adjust your, your shape a little bit here. Just so it is, it looks right. And now I can go on and, and put the base color of all this. which will be sort of a, a warm yellow. It's gonna be a very warm painting. So this is that raw sienna light again. We go straight in here, pick up that bead as he called it. Almost a little too high here. I'll drop some water here. That's okay. It's not so not so bad. But see how integrated this looks. I love, I love that. It's that's yeah. one of the most important things to learn, I think. Beautiful. That sort of people paint different shapes, different um, different objects, shapes, whatever you want to call them, um, according to what they what name they have. You know, this is a house, mm. this is a tree, that's a car. It must be separate, but it isn't. The world is not like that. Nothing is separated. And if we paint it like that, it'll look, look more natural. Makes sense. Uh, Robin would like to know um, whether you ever use hot press paper or what you think of, the, of hot press. Uh, hot press is good too for uh, sometimes for portrait work. It's very nice, I think. For uh, so yes, I do use it sometimes, but um, I most of the time I actually you do use. Uh, just a cold press because like I said this is not a a really strong grain here it's still pretty fairly flat but yeah for portraits for instance it's a, it's a good paper to use so we used to use it with illustrative work too back in the day um, when you did illustration still um, a lot of times they were painted on watercolor paper or that vellum. I don't know if you know what that is. That's that's a very, uh, a lot of illustrators use that paper called vellum. Very flat, right? Very, uh, not flat, but what do you call it? No grain. Okay. So, these are just highlights for the sheep. <laughs> okay, so you're already starting to integrate the, the sheep. Those are uh, where the sheep are going to be. Exactly. So even for these, I paint, you know, I paint the meadow over them basically, or most of it. That way they, they look more integrated later. So I keep this part very warm because that's going to be my light part. Okay. And then this part will be cooler again, more like a repetition of these colors up here. But I'm always very, very careful with the mixing. Like, like I got red in here too, and even a little blue, especially as I come, come down here.
And this is just the first pass here. But that's always kind of a a tough part where you paint around things, paint around shapes. It's but there's no other way in watercolor. You, uh, I mean, you you could put it all like opaque, but I I I like the transparency, so I really try to when I paint watercolor, I want to paint transparent and not opaque usually. I'll do that in other mediums. <laughs> so here for the sheep, this one will have this cooler color on, on, on the side. So I'm gonna drop that in right now. Mm. And it can um, run, it doesn't matter if it runs. Okay, I suppose the other thing you could do would be to lift the, the paint where, where you wanted the sheep. Do you ever do it that way? Right, or you could tape it or Tape it off um, or lift it. Yeah, but see, I like this integration thing going on here. So it's kind of just bleeding into the surroundings. Uh -huh. I think I think that that also makes it look more natural because if you think about it, when you, you know, when a cow or any sort of animal stands in a in a meadow like this, it will somewhat take on the color of that uh, of its surroundings. Mm -hmm. And if you just paint around it, it you lose that. Leslie says the combination of lost and found edges and the warm and cool is beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that's my whole, that's sort of the whole reason why I paint. <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding, but um, I can't stress that enough. If you really want to learn how to paint, you want to, you need to learn how to control temperature. and how to integrate everything. That's sort of the, the biggest part. And that part is kind of arguably is harder in watercolor because I absolutely don't have that luxury that I can just do all that later or come back to it in 20 minutes and think about it. You kind of have to do it as it happens. So this is not the real shadow yet, but you can see I'm already changing the temperature again. Oh yeah. More like up here now. Mm -hmm. Shirley would like to know, are you staying away from staining colors? Uh, usually yes. Uh, I do have thalo blue though that I use quite a bit and that's quite staining. Um, now a little warm again here. But generally speaking, it, it's true. I, I, I don't like to use too many like Prussian blue or something that's, that's a tricky color to use even though it's it's a, it looks beautiful if you if you see it, but it's hard to once it, once it's on there, it's really hard to to change anything. It just that doesn't come off basically, no matter what you do. Um, so I put this horizon blue here, so I'm gonna put it here too in this shadow. Remember the sky would be in here too.
and you know it's a little bit distorted because I still have that fast angle here, but I will change the angle in the second wash. Do you always start with dry paper or are there times when you would wet with clear water first? Uh, yes, both ways can be the could be the case. Sometimes it's better to pre-wet it. Other times dry. Yeah. Here dry because I don't to paint around all this. So if I wet all this, you you'd have to find a way to just paint this strip only and you know that doesn't make sense oh, yeah. so oh yeah so in this case i had to leave it dry almost so it's situational sometimes you need it other times you don't it's it depends i'm going to have to spray it a bit because it's starting to dry here yeah. So you can see I'm sneaking in some cool colors, some warm colors. A little more red here, maybe. I just want to remind people they can put questions in the chat if they'd like, and then I will uh, pass those questions along as I as time permits. And then here, warmer. It's sort of this red in the shadow, so it won't be very warm. More like the carmine. That run. Important part is that when you when you paint shadows, it's always important to have not just one shadow color. I see this a lot. It, you see the shadow, okay, we'll just mix a violet and put that everywhere. But if you if you want to make it more interesting or more lifelike, even you uh, you mix different colors in it. and then let them run, you know? And also repeating this, this red down here, you will notice, you notice probably that it's in the sky also. So, so people call this color unity. Okay. So as a rule, do you avoid masking fluid? As a rule, uh, yeah, I actually never used it ever. Okay. I don't know uh, how how it would work. Actually, I mean, I know technically, I kind of have an idea of how it works, but I never actually tried it. So you could see, you know. This integration I was talking about. Yeah. Leslie would like to know, do you punctuate dark values as you go or at the, do you go back at the end and do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes you can, you can do it as you go, for instance, in certain areas, like for instance, the next step would be to finish let's say this background with this building absolutely would put some darks right away or while I finish this part only whereas there's nothing here. So um, I don't really wait till the very end to do them. I, I, I probably do it more as I go than, and then another step at the end maybe, but yeah, I guess that answers it because I feel like the more I can finish a certain section and then the more I know this section is correct, 
everything else I do, I can compare to that. And that's often the problem people fight with, especially in this medium where you sort of work backwards, you know, light dark as opposed to dark light. So in this mid tony field, you never know what's right, what's wrong, right? And it feels good now. And then you start painting again and all of a sudden everything looks wrong again because you, you got down to the next dark step. So whereas if you finish one section, you know this is right. And then you compare it to that. It makes the whole, the rest of the process easier. So yeah, that's, if I, if I were to uh, recommend, I would say, yeah, paint it as you, as you go, the darks. Or at least the medium darks to the darks. There's hardly ever any real darks anyways, you know. It's like that whole idea with lights and darks. And I use a lot of, uh, you know, I paint these strips and then just cut them out. And then you can kind of see where you are and you see in this step, there's nothing stronger than this. So mm -hmm. all this is missing, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting because you put this here and it's like, wow, well, that's dark. And whereas if you look at it like this, you can't tell. Yeah. That's the problem with values. You, you need something to compare it to, otherwise you're kind of lost. You don't know, you have no idea how dark this is. If you compare it to all this, but if you have this, then you know, oh, that's not that dark, right? Right. So, because it's easy that your eyes get deceived very easily with the values and it's very easy to, um, to put, to stay either too light or too dark, basically. So, I think this is ready. So here's one trick too, because in this picture, there's a very dark tree sort of in the shadows here. I don't know if you can see that, I hope so. It's so over here, sort of peaking, falling off the edge almost, but it's a darker tree that sort of frames the left side. So if I put this now, I'll have an easier time to paint this. Okay. <clears throat> and again, um, when I say dark, it's never this dark, you know, it's like when we say the medium darks are like this range, those are the darkest darks, because the very, very dark, you hardly ever use that. You okay. use it sometimes, but, you know, sparingly, kind of like the white, you know. Okay. So those two extremes, the hardest part is making the mid-tones work. That's the hardest part. So darker mid-tones is what people mean when they say darks. So Lindy is curious, is your big mop brush your own label? Uh, this one, yes. But I, I don't have those anymore because, well, I can tell the story because this whole like ambassadorship, they call this, right? Okay. Where you represent a brand and and uh, in this case, it was the Da Vinci brushes. They make great brushes. There's no question about it. But the problem was I had my own brush series and then all I get is emails about brushes. So, mm -hmm. you know, I became a brush peddler and that's not what I want to be. So I decided to stop. Okay. I don't want that. I want to be an artist and I want to get emails about brushes all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, like I'm some sort of art supply store, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the same, the other problem was with Daniel Smith 
Um, because really, I don't really use only Daniel Smith, and I can't go around tell everybody, oh, Daniel Smith is the best thing ever when I'm using Holbein, right? Right. Uh, I love Daniel Smith, don't get me wrong, they have great, great product, but I don't only use them, I use other products too. So I started, I stopped that too. Uh, Michael would like to know uh, if is the paper still moist right now or is it dry? What's the? Well, it better be dry. So <laughs> that's why I keep touching it here. Okay, so you're wanting it to be dry for the next layer. I absolutely wanted it to be dry, yes. If it's a little bit wet, like these darker sections, mm -hmm. maybe it's okay, but uh, you can always use a hair dryer, but I don't really usually do that. I, I just wait. And as soon as you put a little brush stroke here and there, um, you know right away if it's ready. So this is sort of that darker tree that that will go in this corner. Okay. And again, it's not super dark, but it's pretty dark. And it's gonna be more importantly, it's gonna have the the temperature of it is basically cool. And that will really uh, create a separation here. You can see my brushes make really nice marks. Bring that down to about here. I can pick that up later. And then I'll go back to the green. I'm just kind of watching this, see how it dries. So softening an edge here. <clears throat> and then go into this, there's more sheep here, I guess, so. And then I lose some edges. First you put them on and you lose them. How weird is that? <laughs> <laughs> make up your mind. <laughs> I know, make up your mind already. But see, the, the, with this first wash underneath, it makes this beautiful sort of ethereal look, which it's really a lot of fun to paint because like I said, you know, it does these things by itself. Look, it's opening this part up now. And then again, some darker parts into it. And keep this, let this, leave this soft, and then go into this big tree. And again, I'll spray here. And you're spraying to soften that edge? Exactly. At least on the left side there.
but you can't soften everywhere because then you don't get an edge at all. So sort of a, you just have to look. So we get to see a little bit of the trunk there. Right, exactly. And then the right side is cooler. So I go into this more blue. Just like uh, sort of a repetition, a little bit of the first go here. Shirley would like to know if you do a thumbnail value study um, before you paint. Uh, sometimes, sometimes. It depends. Um, especially if you don't know exactly how you're going to do it. It's definitely a good thing. Or even a value study. You know, some people do extensive value studies. And, you know, that's that's fine. That's It's a good idea. Pat would like to know if you ever studied Chinese calligraphy. I have not, no. This is just something I picked up in China uh, when I was at one of those events. Okay. And uh, I, I noticed that many of the Chinese artists were just using one brush to paint the whole painting. And I was kind of impressed. Because here we are, we're using so many brushes and and they do a whole painting with one. And I kind of looked what they have and it had one of those. So this is too light. So I'm gonna make this a little darker here. And of course you can flick water into it. So there's all kinds of neat things you can do with watercolor. So by adding a little water here and there, you're just adding some variety by lightening that area up? Yeah, pretty much. It's, it pretty much just pushes paint around. Like, I don't know if you can see that very well, but sometimes it takes a little while to for it to show up. And you can also use a little foil, and get us a oh. couple of textural okay. things. It's probably too, too early to do that. I'll keep going and then come back for that. Hopefully I won't forget. And then often, you know, from the first wash, I leave the, leave it alone. So it's, it kind of has like openings too and more interesting edges. Uh -huh. and, and was then, that saran wrap that you were using to get that texture on the tree? Yeah, but it didn't really work. I have to redo it. Uh, I'll try to show it again. Because it was too early. You got to catch it at the right minute. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now here, it kind of just goes straight into this blue again. And I mean, you can spray it too, either one. You can do it with the brush or with the sprayer. Same difference. And now, uh, you now while it dries, 
You basically just keep an eye on it. And I'm working very wet, as you can see. So often, I got plenty of time to, to adjust things. Like for instance, my roof is crooked. I need to bring the roofer in. Fix <laughs> that up. There it is. And you have that integrate already again, you know, with see how this brush runs straight into the building. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like it belongs there. And it's not like someone cut it out and and pasted it there. Some plastic wrap might be better than what I have right now. So Jeanette would like you to describe the right time to use that because she has trouble with it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the right time is, is basically just before it's dry, actually. It's kind of a hard thing to describe, but it's getting there. See how it's still blooming? Mm -hmm. So it's really not staying yet. Do you ever use a sea sponge for texture? No, what's that? Sea sponge. A sea sponge, it's... just a, a natural sponge that uh, with a little bit of paint on it to oh. dab on. No, I don't use that. So once it sets up, you can kind of feel it. The best way I can explain it is it's still not there. I mean, I can probably even work on this more where well, that finally sets up. But anyway, um, the idea is to get some texture, more texture up there. You can also do it with paint. I mean, you you know, like, okay, the plastic itself, yes, but you can also dip it in paint. That's kind of fun too. Mm -hmm. so let's flick more water and see. Yeah, it's still wet. But see, the flicking does it too. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see that better right away. Oh, yeah. Oh, a mixture about, of both that's getting there. What about using a dry brush technique to add texture? Do you like to do that sometimes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it has to be dry, of course. Yeah, yeah. So I'm still in that stage where I adjust values here, but I'm almost done with this section. So. Like behind here, it could be a little darker. Here and there, not too much. And that's good. It's good to compare it to this. Mm -hmm. Like this is still wet, so it will kind of ex do a little bit of an explosion, but that's fine here. And I got all kinds of edges here, see that? Yes, lots of, uh, some lost and some found and some in between. Exactly, and that's, that's the whole range. What watercolor can do, you should try to get it. It makes for a very, uh, like right now, I'm taking this paint off a little here and there. Mm. So there's lots of possibilities.
And there's even another shed here now. I got a free shed. <laughs> Let's try this again. Much better. And then what it does too, it goes into the, you know, it picks up some of the pain and you, it puts it in other places. It's kind of fun too. And then obviously you can scratch something in. You need to see more of these trees or something. And this is very weather dependent, by the way, um, how long this stays open. Because as you know, we had so much rain and the, the climate is, is very different right now than it, let's say in the summer. So uh, your watercolor stays open much longer than it usually does, I want to say. Okay. Leslie would like to pick your brain on, um, do you have an uh, opinion or guidance as to developing the composition as to the percentage of darks, lights, lost and found edges, or uh, composition in general? Composition in general, yeah, tricky, tricky subject, generally speaking, because it's very intuitive. Um, and there's rules for compositions. Obviously, we all, well, we all learned lots of them. But, you know, in the end, it's also very, very intuitive. Uh, but uh, I would say, when it comes to composition, you always want to go with your intuition first. Like what you think you should do is most likely the right thing. Um, unless you're, you know, you're having a bad day or something, but. But is there a rule for how many percentage of darts, lights? Not really. I mean, I would, I would al almost say uh, a lot of times it's kind of nice to have a path through a picture. I think uh, that's a very strong way of moving people's eyes around. You can play with focal point, but you know, that's sort of overrated. You know, some people make the focal point like it's that's that's all the picture needs, or every picture absolutely needs to have one. You know, uh, be I would be very careful with statements like that because really nothing needs to be happening. You can do whatever you want, it's it's art. And if it's a great picture in the end, who's to argue, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, with the percentages and formulas and actually, Try to stay away from it as much as you can. It's, it's good to learn these things, don't get me wrong. But then it's also good to sort of forget, forget about them and, and kind of do your own thing. Because that's what makes your art your, yours. If you just go what, you know, sometimes teachers tell you, you know, then you end up looking like like the teacher's painting, you know, that's not, that can't be the goal. It should look like your painting. But anyway, I mean, this, this is just general tips now, but yeah, I, I like, I like to see in a watercolor, it has to have a good composition or sound, but it also needs uh, all the, temperature changes, the edges, and the values too. Um, so it's a whole package, you know? 
It really is. And that goes not only for watercolor, it um, goes for any kind of painting. <laughs> so I'm gonna work on this, some of these sheeps for a bit, get the sheep going, um, and then really just the shadow. I don't know if I answered the question well. But... I think you did. Leslie says, great response. Oh, thank you. I think one of the things that uh, is the most important thing is, uh, is an emotional connection to your work. I think that's what really makes the picture your picture. And what do I mean by that? It, um, it, it basically means if you have something to say and you paint in the moment um, and you have the skill, the skill is a must, you know, it's not, I'm not one of those people advocating that you, you know, you don't have to have skill, you do. You have to have a lot of painting time, blood, sweat, and tears. You have to put the time into it. But once you got, you did all that, and it becomes like a, you know, it's no longer about how do I paint that. Then you, um, you really have this opportunity to, to make it yours by just, really staying staying connected with your work as you paint. And then your work will look like yours and no one else's. So I have this warm and cool for this one here. So I'm kind of mixing it as I go. This one is the one that's sort of in the half shadow or And again, it, you notice I don't really paint legs here. Um, I'll try to show these. These are just little squiggy things, basically. Um, because, you know, again, integration is more important. And the, the overall shape of the sheep, the roundness, that's all it needs. And this is a little too blue, so I put a little yellow and red into it. Mostly yellow. I'll push the blue away, hopefully. And then, um, Back there. there. Could be more sheep there, but who knows? I mean, Shirley would like to know uh, when you do your first wash in landscapes, do you always do the skies first? And then Most, move to the mostly. Post? Yeah, mostly yes, because the sky is usually the lightest value in the picture. So yes, uh, but not always. Uh, I'm gonna dry brush a little into this. You know, uh, there's no always this, always that. It, it depends on the situation, um, but most of the time, yes you would start with the sky. If you look at the sky here, this is lighter. This is also pretty light, the grass, but 
So you could do the, the sky and the grass and kind of ignore all that too, and then come back to this. But I just prefer to sort of work work my way down and already put like the right values or close to the right values as I go. For me, that makes the process easier than just literally painting just the lights, the next part of mediums, the middle mediums, darker mediums. You know, you could separate it like that too. It, or some people paint, you know, they paint the finished pro, pro, the finished product right away. You know, they just keep painting, keep painting, and then it's really just one wash. That's possible too. So the more you paint, the more you'll you'll figure out what what works for you. I think that's really. Um, that's really the bottom line. Well, that makes sense. Because I always, you know, when I paint, I used to always have, you know, like when you, you know, the progression when you start out and you, after the materials, you have a certain process you, you always do. But the more you paint, the, the more like, it's it's like you almost abandon that whole thing of having sort of a plan. You you just paint, mm. and these things just happen in the moment, and then you act in the moment. That's the best. That's the best way. Because right. you know when you start the painting, there's no need to like. Remember, I started with this wash up here. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about how I'm going to paint this tree or this house later. It's useless. You know, you just wait till you get to that point and then you paint it when you're there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds weird, but it's not a science. It's uh, it's art. It's this. If it was a science, you could and you could apply a, a math problem or, a, you know, an equation to it. That would be a different thing. But you really can't do that. And if you could, then, you know, it would look generic and, I don't know, boring. And this will connect here. It's still wet, thankfully. <clears throat> so I just have to be dark enough. So right now, it looks dark enough, but of course it'll dry half half that strength, so. <laughs> Over here, a little darker here. Is there a particular size of paintings that you like to paint? Uh, watercolor, right? Right, in watercolor. Um, I like half sheets for some reason. Like 14 by 20 is a really cool okay. format. I like that a lot. I'm not really sure why, but. I hardly ever paint full sheets. I do sometimes, but, um, well, th there's many reasons for it, but mostly because it's really hard to bring them anywhere. Oh. That may sound, may sound strange, but 
you know, when you travel and you bring your work. Yeah. And you have all these full sheet paintings. It's like you almost oh. have to ship them ahead. And, and you oh, know, yeah. nowadays, nowadays it's so expensive to shipping. And so what, I kinda... size is, what size is the brush that you're using? Pat would like to know. Well, that's a, that's a 10 or it's a six actually. In, in normal size, it's a six. I don't know why they call it a 10 here. I think this is just one of those prototypes I got. Okay. But yeah, the, that's a, and the other problem is that most manufacturers, they, uh, you know, they don't have a unit where they say, okay, we're all using the same mm -hmm. measurement. So, so you can have a six and a 10, two different manufacturers, same brush, right? Yeah, I almost hate to ask because it seems like it doesn't really, there's no standardization. There isn't, it's true. <laughs> they don't do that. I, I don't know why, that would be the best thing if they did because uh, it just doesn't make sense to, because I get this question a lot and then you say, well, it's a six, well, you know, they might get a six from another brand and not the same six. So I'm starting to do a little texture here too. So this is uh, wet into wet now. Right into right? Right. yeah, yeah. Just kind of still watching all this, but I think it's, it's trying okay. And then we can do more texture with wicking water. Mm. Just a little bit, so there's a little more just in the foreground and then also these poles go in. I surely would like to know if you've tried varnish for protecting your finished artwork versus using glass or acrylic. I did, yes. I think what it works really well. I like it. Because huh? it you don't have to put that big mat board around it so uh more and more artists actually do that now uh, i i did it too uh for a show once not for the competitions but you know like for regular show gallery shows regular uh -huh. um, it was really well received people loved it oh good to know yeah, because they can't, some of them, they tell you, oh, I don't know what that was, but what, what medium it was. And I kind of like that. It's, I, I really, if you don't like, if they don't judge it by the medium, because, you know, when they see the big, the big map boards, uh, on that wall is the watercolor wall, basically. And if they don't see that, then sometimes they can't tell what it is. Is that a pastel? What is it? So what kind of varnish do you use? Uh, Liquitex. Um, they have different ones. But I think uh, uh, it's, uh, I think it was a semi-gloss. I don't like the super gloss. They have that too. It's kind of like the same as in oil painting you, I use, I never use that super glossy varnish. I actually don't like that. But semi-gloss or even matte looks great. It really depends on what, what you personally like. Uh, what you have to, my tip is to experiment on old watercolors, just, you know, the ones that 
you don't really care much about, but then you can get some varnish and play with it and see what it looks like. Makes and, sense to me. Yeah, you can really uh, figure it out that way. You can see this is still sort of drying, so I can also flick in some paint. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, some of that green here. So the varnish product is a spray? Uh, well, it comes as a spray, yes, but it also, uh, it also comes as a, like a, paint application. So either way. Some people really like the spray. I, I, the spray is probably good for watercolor. Let me see if I have some here. Um, well, I just have this one. But that's one of them. Liquid text is a good one. And uh, so this one you uh, you basically put on with a brush. Okay, so it won't upset the watercolor underneath it to brush over it with varnish? No, but you do have to be, a, a, you know, you have to be careful and use a really soft, big fat brush like the hockey uh -huh. and just go. I never had a problem. Um, okay, so now poles. No, I'm almost there. So we we got to finish, right? So, yeah, we got about ten more minutes. So uh, the other thing, like some of these things, like poles, you know, they they can all if there are suggestions, that's that's good enough. Mm -hmm. They can kind of disappear down here. It goes all over the place. <laughs> But you get the idea. It's uh, again still wet, so I can still play. I can even do my dry brushing. And then here it's dry. Here it's wet. Into that again with the. And then also when you, uh, one more thing I wanted to show too. I mean, the rest would just be finishing work, right? Uh, then you can, mm -hmm. you can say, okay, I'm gonna get a little light back here. So I use it, use a paper towel and just kind of take this off so as if there was a little bit of a, lighter spot here. So, you know, makes it more interesting. Here I got a big drop now that I can use my hawk and get rid of it. Look at that. Uh -huh. Look at that. So Leslie would like to know, um, in finishing your paintings, how do you consider the final evaluation of values, punctuation of light and shade and other considerations for the final product? Always, again, by intuition, but you also look around and see, okay, I don't have many darks here yet. Do I, do I wanna put more darks back here? More darks into the sheep, more darks into the foreground. Like for instance, my poles are a little light still. Um, you know, just by looking around and basically, 
strengthening certain areas up. Uh, that's really all. Um, you know, it depends on the picture too. Some picture are more high key, more some are more low key. So this is not especially a dark picture. So Carla I wouldn't has, wanna, okay. yeah, go ahead. Carla has, also has a question. The, the foreground is cooler than one would expect. Was there a reason you decided on that color mixture? the foreground yeah i wanted to i wanted to have this warm in the middle come forward so so it's cool here cool here and we got this warm strip in the middle that was sort of the intention for this painting <laughs> And then here I would couple dry brush strokes into this. And this is, for instance, adjusting these sheep in value, or maybe adding another one here that's sort of disappearing in the mm -hmm. in the dark area here. Nice. It's not really there, but it's there enough. So those are things you do last. You could also do like, like once this is completely dry, it's very possible to adjust the temperature of this shadow too. Like I'm, I'm much lighter here. I can bring more of that warmth into here if I wanted to. So, cause you know, I had great variation within. It doesn't seem, doesn't seem like it from far away maybe, but you could see the warmth and the cools within. And I can warm this part up, for instance, more. So there's many, many things you can still do. One thing you can't do is change major values, of course. That's not possible in watercolor. Once it's there, it's there. But I think I'm done. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Not too bad, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll pe peel this off too because got a lot of this dirt on the tape here. And you can look at it without the tape. There it is. Sheila says, great work in warm and cool tones. That's Leslie it, says, yeah. If you look, you could see slight adjustments make this more red maybe, but you see the reds here and here and in here too. So the blues, even in the tree. So there's a certain... Um, connectedness in the picture, unified. At least that's what I'm trying in my work. So I hope you liked it. Yes. I know uh, it took almost the whole time, wow. That's that's great, that's perfect. And um, we are getting lots of positive feedback in the chat. Um, oh, really a you. symphony of a painting, great approach, uh, great demo. Thank you so much. This has been awesome.
Awesome. Yeah, and I'll see you guys next month, basically, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So uh, just a reminder, um, if you haven't signed up, even though Frank's workshop is full, um, there are occasions where people um, find they have to drop out and we can take from a waiting list. So uh, if you want to get on that waiting list, um, you might still be able to get in. And we will look forward to that learning experience next oh, I like the comments here. I love the dreamy horizon effect. Yeah, that's it. Dreamy is good. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking really looking forward to it, Frank. Uh, can't thank wait to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all thanks for turning out tonight, and um, we will do it again next month. And we will uh, be getting together with you at your workshop, Frank. Thank you so Alrighty. much. This was awesome. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. It was terrific. Thank you, Frank. Great demo. Thank you. I'm still on my phone here. Yeah. <laughs> hey Frank, um, yeah. could you if you could send me a, a a a a screen a photo of your final painting there, and also yeah, yeah. if you give me the, either the, uh, send me the reference or the painting that you did it from, I'll include those in the video. Okay. Thank okay, you, I'll sir. do that tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We will All see right. you uh, in a month. I don't know if you saw the hotel rooms I got for you. Uh, the location and stuff. I'll, I'll reset yeah. that to you. And I can take care of that day that you talked about. Oh, you did. Oh, I should have wow, thought cool. of that before. Uh, I, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking either because I was that was sort of a miscommunication because, yeah, I need yeah. The, the day before is more important than the <laughs> than the <laughs> night after, of course. Uh, I don't know. I, I, maybe I thought you were coming up from San Jose. So anyway, thank you. And uh, yeah. we're looking forward to it. All right, great. See you then. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye. good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle.